Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is In Pursuit of Purpose, the story of a billion dollar breakaway turned fee only independent entrepreneur. It's a conversation with Jeff Thomas, founder and CEO of Archetype Wealth Partners. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, feel free to share it widely. While the ultimate decision to make the leap to independence varies from advisor to advisor, one deciding factor I have found they all share is the desire to do more or do better for their clients. As Morgan Stanley breakaway Jeff Thomas put it, he didn't want to have his epitaph read, and I quote, here lies Jeff, he made rich people richer. As he shares in a book he wrote, Trading Up, Moving from Success to Significance on Wall Street, Jeff had built a business from scratch to over a million dollars in just five years, and it kept growing from there, on up to a billion dollars in assets under management while at Morgan Stanley. But as his business grew, even though he was happy in his personal life, he felt he lacked purpose. Jeff was inspired to go deeper in the planning process with clients. By putting clients' narrative before their numbers, Jeff was able to help them uncover their family's values and connect their resources to those values. After 25 years of working for the biggest names on Wall Street, Jeff and his team concluded that they could only pursue their vision by starting their own independent firm. So in April of 2017, Jeff and his team left three quarters of their billion dollar business at Morgan and transitioned to a completely fee-based business when they opened Archetype Wealth Partners in Houston, Texas. Their goal? To provide a next-generation, conflict-free platform where advisors and clients could flourish. And some three years later, they more than doubled their assets to over $500 million as of this recording. Jeff is a stand-up guy, with accolades including being named to Morgan Stanley's Chairman's Club, Barron's Top Advisors, and Financial Times' America's Top 400 Advisors. In this episode, Jeff shares the defining moments in which he identified it was time to go independent, why he and his team chose to build it on their own, the importance of scale, and how that all plays into Archetype's unique value proposition, and much more. So let's get to it. Jeff, thank you so much for joining me today. It's great to be with you, Mindy. I'm a fan of your podcast. That's great. Let's jump in. So first question, not a hard one. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I've been in the business, I guess, uh, just shy of 30 years and spent about 25 years at the wire houses. Last stop, Morgan Stanley, for 17 years before launching our own, our own firm, Archetype Wealth Partners, in April of 2017. So that's the, the quick version. <laughs> Okay. So we'll get to the why and the how and all of that, but what is Archetype's value proposition? I think the best way to talk about that is probably just with the vision and mission statement, which we repeat every week in a firm-wide call. We don't, we, we didn't write it and then bury it. We know that happens a lot, but our vision is really the most important thing to us, which is to build the ideal God-honoring wealth management company. Uh, Archetype means ideal model. And so we had uh, all these ideas about what that ideal model looked like for the future. And so uh, that's the vision we, we crafted. And then the mission, I think, speaks to your question about the value proposition. Our mission really is our value proposition, which is to help families thrive across generations, connecting their money with their purpose. So I know that purpose means a lot to you. I've read your book. So talk to us a little bit about what that means to you and how that connects to the business you run. 
Yeah, the, the thanks for asking. The book's called Trading Up, Moving from Success to Significance on Wall Street. And really the, uh, the impetus for uh, the vision we have and for everything we're doing really just came from my own personal experience where after I was in the business about 10 years, uh, I'd built a, a pretty good sized business from scratch to over a million dollars in five years and it kept growing. And I got about 10 years deep and, and this is you know many years ago, but I just kind of felt empty about it. I sort of thought, well, maybe if I could help all these people make more money and uh, you know, if I could make a few bucks, maybe that would lead me to a happy life. I had a great marriage and, and great kids and all, but I just felt a little empty and I wasn't sure quite what my purpose was. So that sort of led me down a trail of doing a lot of Bible study and this sort of thing, which led me to a place of realizing that I was really putting money above God uh, for myself. And I felt like my priorities were off. And so as my wife and I started becoming more generous, uh, reading these principles in the Bible about generosity, leading to joy, and all of these kind of things. It just put me on a different path. And then I felt led to start communicating that kind of wisdom with clients. And it just got so much more energy for the business, helping them think about how to give back and these sort of things. And so uh, not being prescriptive, but that was kind of the impetus for this whole uh, eventual transition. And I want to talk more about your mission and how that mission of valuing success versus significance and the significance being more important to you, how that transformed your business. And we'll come back to that. But let's talk for a minute about Archetype, the fee-only RIA that you now run. How many employees, how much in assets under management, what kind of clients do you serve? And just asking so we can give our listeners some perspective on who you are. Sure. We've got 14 employees. We started with five in April of 2017. That's quite a few more uh, than we have, but we know we're still small. Our team, as we were talking pre-show, we partnered with about 50 different advisors throughout Morgan Stanley before we left. So our assets were a bit inflated because when we would look at our asset run, it would include the assets of some of our other partners. Uh, so when we were at Morgan Stanley, said we had over a billion in assets. The, the reality of what our team ran locally in Houston, Texas, was uh, between 325 and 350 million. And so when we decided to go RIA only, which I'm sure we'll get into that discussion, we brought over about 250 million to start. And now we're uh, just shy of 500 million uh, about three and a half years later. Yeah, congrats on that. So, all right, you left the wirehouse world in April of 17 to launch Archetype. What was going on at the firm at the time that led you to launch your own independent firm? Yeah, and I would say, Mindy, one of the things I really like about your podcast is, and, and your approach, is just trying to help people get information so they can make the best decision for themselves. And so for us, this was less about what the firm was doing or not doing and more about the vision we had and our inability to execute that vision at the wirehouse. So one of the big issues is, of course, compliance, where they sort of manage to the lowest common denominator. That That's really not a, a knock on the big wirehouses. It's just kind of a fact of life, right? If you and I are running an organization with 50,000 employees, you got to have rules that sort of catch everybody. You can't have different rules for everybody. So that's kind of the net result of having a giant organization and also a result of having a broker dealer relationship, right? When you're a registered representative, by definition, you represent the firm and there's a lot more conflicts of interest you got to worry about and a lot more distraction of training and all of those kind of things that, that really we didn't need to have. And so our vision of dealing with families, our target market is really 10 million plus business owners selling their companies who want to be generous. That's our niche. We have plenty of folks that aren't in that niche or smaller or not business owners that get referred in and that sort of thing. But for those folks, family dynamics, dealing with what we call right brain issues of family dynamics and legacy, those are big things for us to talk about with families. They often come for the investments in planning, but uh, we often end up talking about other things. And so our ability to communicate, put out original content, do seminars, white papers, all of the communication was just more difficult inside the wirehouse. So we felt led to start our own firm. 
Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. What's going through my mind as you're talking about that is we talk a lot with advisors about the pushes and the pulls of making a move that for everyone, there's always a certain amount of pushes, the frustrations, the limitations, the things you're upset about. But if there isn't an equal amount of pulls, meaning excitement or passion or enthusiasm about where you're going, pushes alone probably isn't enough. And what I hear you saying is while you might have been frustrated about an inability to execute your vision, the ability to communicate with freedom the way you wanted to, what it really was about was sort of a vision of the way you believed you wanted your clients to be served and you wanted to go out and create that. Exactly. And I think that's so well said. And I think the picture I got in my head is, and I really do like the way you communicate where you're saying, look, you're not trying to jam one channel down anyone's throat, right? Just you do a good job of listening to people and listening to what their vision is of their future and kind of helping them guide them into that place. So for us, it was a vision. I believe sort of God gave me this vision in 2010 when I was sitting with a mentor of mine. He literally said, I want you to scale what my mentor has started. And my mentor is a guy named Ron Blue, who started a, a firm of his own name uh, in 1979. He started an RIA in 1979. Can you imagine how far ahead uh, he was doing that? And uh, it's eventually been sold to an insurance company and so forth. But I felt like God say, uh, I want you to scale what this guy started. And uh, so scale's always been important to us. And so we tried to scale within Morgan Stanley, the super team. But ultimately, it wasn't built. You know, it's, it's really built for silos and small teams. It's not really built for like a company inside the company, if you will. And so I think we have this vision of fiduciary only, creating a real professional organization where there's different roles. Business development is separate from client advice, is separate from client experience, is separate from portfolio management. You and I grew up in the accounting business, you know, right out of college. And of course, they're very regimented staff, senior staff, junior manager, manager, you know, and maybe it doesn't have to be that regimented. But maybe a little more regimented than just everybody's kind of hanging their own shingle. So that's kind of part of the vision we had. And we just could not execute the vision God gave us uh, where we were. So at that time, did you just know that if you were going to leave the wirehouse world, that it was going to be to go independent? Or did you look at other options as well? We really did not look at other options. And, and I would tell you, I'm kind of the reluctant entrepreneur. Even though I was the kid with the uh, mowing all the lawns in the Midwest growing up and, you know, that kind of thing. I always had jobs. I always had a little business going. And I thought of the wealth management business, even at the big firms. I thought of myself kind of as an entrepreneur, but I didn't really call myself that. I was more on the financial advisor side, giving financial advice is kind of how I thought about my core business role. With that all changed when uh, sort of sort of God really delivered this vision to me, I believe. And then I remember saying to him, well, God, you said scale. I've never scaled anything. <laughs> and, and I remember thinking, but now I was on all these committees at Morgan Stanley, right? At the advisory board for the bank and on all these committees. And, you know, they always ask for feedback, right? All these committees they form for advisors. So I would always give my feedback and it was always a little more radical than the things they wanted to do. You know, so I had a lot of opinions about how the business should be done. And then God gave me this vision for scale. But I said to him, I said, hey, it sounds like fun, God, but I think you got the wrong guy. I don't know how to scale anything. And he felt he, he told me, hey, that's why I picked you. I know you can't do it. So wake up and take instructions every day. I'll do it for you. Just be obedient to I'll show you the way day by day. And that's what he's done. Uh, that was in 2010. We gave me that vision and we finally just had to execute it outside of Morgan Stanley in 2017. And it's just been so much fun uh, following that path. Well, I want to hear more about the fun path, but but let me unpack a couple of things. You told me that you are the ultimate do-it-yourselfer and that when you determined that you needed to be independent in order to execute on this vision, you were determined to understand every component of the business to build for scale. So you opted not to work with a service provider or a consultant. And that is an unusual path in and of itself because today this enormous ecosystem has been born to support the breakaway advisor. And a lot of wirehouse advisors would be thrilled to offload the minutia of both building the business and run it. So tell us where did you get your support from and what was behind that? How hard was it to do it yourself? 
That's such a great question. And one of the things I love about this podcast is we were talking earlier about how it's so smart because advisors like me, when I was considering breaking away, you're so concerned about privacy and where can you go to learn these things? And so I guarantee you there's people listening right now. They're thinking about this. They're doing their research. You know, maybe they're praying about what to do. They're all of these kind of things. And who can you talk to? And this is a great source. And so for me, your podcast hadn't started yet. So there was a, the local representative of Schwab, uh, okay, that dealt with breakaways, had actually worked at Smith Barney. And for a brief time after the Smith Barney Morgan Stanley merger, or I guess acquisition of Smith Barney, technically, had worked there at the firm. And so in the planning center, so I knew him. Uh, and so he was probably my number one source. He would give me all the white papers from Schwab. Schwab, of course, is the largest custodian for, for uh, RIA. So they, they have a lot of information. They know all the technology providers. They'll help you with all the resources you could possibly have. And then I had one friend <laughs> who had been at the wirehouses, who was also, it was about five years ahead of us. And I picked his brain all the time about very practical things from the advisor perspective. So from a platform perspective, Schwab did a great job of helping us learn about all the different components and things we needed. And then my, my friend that was already out uh, helped me a lot as well, showing me the steps. And what I would say is, again, it's sort of a reluctant entrepreneur. I told you, I'm not the kind of person who builds his own house. There's almost nothing DIY about me <laughs> in other parts of my life. So for me, this was just complete obedience in pursuing the vision I feel God gave me, which was to build the components so that we could understand each piece because the key word for us was scale. Okay. Our vision is to scale. So if you're going to scale, we didn't want to be dependent on a third party because we may not be able to change out the pieces we need to do as we grow. That's what I was fearful of. So we did pick out each component. And I would say this to complete the answer. I would never recommend it to anyone to do it the path we did it. It was so much work unless you have a vision for that kind of stuff. If you have a vision to scale and you need all those components, great. But I met with Cheryl Penny at the Impact Conference with Schwab, and uh, I understood all the things they could do. They have a great suite of services. There's plenty of others that do it. You probably know the list better than I do. And so I think that's a great answer for many people. But for a lot of folks, they probably ought to join an existing RIA. And if they're going to launch their own, use the easy button, we call it. Somebody to kind of help them do it. But we did it. And then our vision is to have other folks join what we're up to. So you say the vision was about building for scale. And you felt that in order to do that, you needed to understand every aspect of the business, if you will. So I guess it's a fair question. What is your expectation three years in of what do you want to do with that scale? What does that look like? You know, we call it the Chick-fil-A of wealth management, Mindy, is kind <laughs> of the vision we've got. If you made me uh, have only one picture to show, I've told our management team this, if I could only show one picture that sort of speaks uh, maybe more than a thousand words about what we're trying to create, it would be like a standalone Chick-fil-A with, you know, at lunchtime. I had Chick-fil-A for lunch today, actually. <laughs> and there's a line wrapped three times around it and they get you out in 15 minutes. So if I go to McDonald's down the street, I might be the third car in line instead of the 30th car in line. But often it'd take me just as long to get through the line as Chick-fil-A. And my wife doesn't love the analogy because we're not serving fast food. OK, it's not the same industry. We understand we're not trying to be a volume game. We're more of a high touch, high service, professional service business, obviously. But this idea of what a well-oiled machine they run and uh, they run on biblical principles, but they don't shove them down anybody's throat. That's the way we like to operate. We want to win business by being excellent at what we do. And oh, by the way, we run on these biblical principles. And if you want to know the root cause, we're happy to talk about it. So we think that's a lot like the culture Chick-fil-A has built. And then they have scaled this thing in an amazing way. And so people love to work there. They make more money working there than, they, than the same jobs other places. That's all the kind of stuff we want to build. So we would really love, you know, maybe a generation from now to be in the national conversation and, and have a scaled top 10, top 20 wealth management business in the United States. That would be the ultimate dream. But we know we have a long way to go. But that makes sense. And I thought that that's what you were going to say, that eventually you're looking to build much more than a local presence, but instead move to a regional or national presence. And that would be the definition of scale. So got it. Thank you. I know you also opted to do something 
a, an additional thing out of the ordinary when you built the business. And that was to go fee only right out of the gate. And our, you, what you said to me in our pre-call was that probably 15% of your revenue at the time when you left Morgan was transactional. And you made the decision to rip off the Band-Aid and go fee only and leave behind those assets, which is not an easy thing to do. So tell us a little bit about what was behind that decision. Why go fee only? This is such a great question. And I know that there are people listening to this right now struggling with this issue, right? Since you say, you know, only mid-teens to high-teens percentage of wealth management is being done RIA only, in the United States, of course, that's growing quickly, right? It's growing 8 to 10% a year. That channel, the RA only channel is growing 8 to 10%. The wirehouses are declining in terms of market share, 1% or 2%. But of course, those numbers add up, right? They've got trillions <laughs> and uh, the RAs have billions. And so the money is moving. So when you start reading the Cerulli and other industry reports, doing your research, you know that the RIA channel is the fastest growing. You know, you look at other countries, that are already endorsing a fiduciary model. You know, we're, we're still kind of fighting about it within the legal structures within the United States. You know, you've got a lot of these incumbent large wirehouses that have, uh, you know, a big lobby and they have an installed base of a lot of brokerage business. I understand why they wouldn't want to adhere to a fiduciary standard, but I think the handwriting's on the wall and I think we're headed in that direction over the next generation. And I equate it kind of to the... Uh, you know, like I, I was talking about, you and I had grown up the accounting business or the legal business or even physicians, where you just assume that your lawyer or your CPA, they are by definition fiduciaries and only represent you. You don't ask them what their conflicts of interest are. And we're just not there yet as an industry uh, in the wealth management space. But I think it's so obvious that that's where we're headed. So we really just made a decision. Again, coming back to the vision, I just can't overstate our vision really drives everything we do, including picking being RA only, because we're not doing things that will maximize our profits for the next three years. We're doing it so that the, the business can scale over the next 30 or 100 years. So if 30 years from now, we think 85% of the business will be done RIA only, let's just do it now. And we think the larger families were already asking us, you know, do you represent us 100% of the time? They don't really understand the word fiduciary generally. But do you represent us 100%? Are there any conflicts of interest? We just could not honestly answer yes to that question when we were at the wirehouse. Now we can. And we really feel like the percentage of business we win uh, in bake-offs will only continue to rise as, as the public is educated about this. Did you lose any clients as a result of going fee-only when you moved? No, just revenue, Mindy. Uh. <laughs> so what happened was one of the software pieces we have is Black Diamond. It's a consolidator, right? And so what we did, you know, we had some private equity investments, those kind of things, a few insurance products and that sort of thing at, at uh, still at Morgan Stanley. And so with the client's permission, we can still view those. We left those assets and therefore revenue trails at Morgan Stanley. And we consolidate those in. We still look at those, those feed, those assets feed automatically into our financial planning software. We use Money Guide Pro and then we consult on those. But we're not getting paid. But we think over time, and it's already proven to be true, right? The assets have already doubled from where we uh, started and we're gaining more, you know, wallet share. From folks. And, you know, it's worth asking. So what do you think has contributed most to the doubling of assets? I come back to the vision. It, it, that's a biblical principle, right? Without vision, the people perish. And I just think we have such a clear vision and mission. And we have our values that we repeat each week. Uh, we have 12 principles. We go through one of those each month in detail. This idea, when I, when I have that picture in my head of the Chick-fil-A standalone with the line around the door, one of the things that's unique about Chick-fil-A is they have operators, not franchisees. But what that means is the folks that run those standalone Chick-fil-A's, they put about $10,000 in the kitty and they make uh, you know six to $800,000 as an operator on average. Whereas some of the McDonald's franchisees uh, have to put up millions of dollars and they may not make the same income. So this idea of one firm for greater impact. 
So just like Chick-fil-A does not have franchisees, they have operators. That's how we look at it. One firm for greater impact. So we think we can be more efficient and operate every city and branch of archetype uh, in a similar manner and be more efficient and, and, and grow. So, and then people come to us really, like you said, the pull, I think has to be stronger than the push. I like the way you said that. So the advisors that are joining us are people who literally feel called, like this is their calling to be in a place to steward their clients, to communicate biblical wisdom, to have others doing it and work in a team environment. If they really want to work in a team environment and have that kind of a culture uh, with a real marketing engine behind them to serve business owners in transition who want to be generous, I mean, that's a pretty narrow gate, right? So it sort of self-selects the kind of people who are going to join us. Yeah, but did that growth from $250 million to $500 million come from recruiting other advisors who brought their businesses, or did it come from organic growth by way of getting more wallet share from existing clients or bringing in new business? Good question. It's really half and half. And, and that's kind of our vision for the future. Out of 14 people, Mindy, we have essentially two full-time marketing people. One that does analytics, right? Who's clicking on what? We use HubSpot and all these things. So we put out a lot of content and we can tell what clients and prospects are clicking on and what they're interested in. And we produce more of the stuff they're interested in and less of the stuff they're not, right? So we want to be on the cutting edge of organic marketing and put leads on our financial advisors' desks, okay? That's been half of the growth. The other half of the growth has been recruiting of other advisors who have a book of business who want to bring that over and steward their clients sort of the archetype way. Yeah, and that's the way to build it. I've had the privilege and pleasure of talking with many successful business owners via this podcast over the years. And for most of them, it's a combination of organic growth first and then adding inorganic growth to the mix. So kudos to you. Let me back up again to what we were talking about. So when you left the wirehouse world behind, was it hard to leave behind a big brand name? <laughs> it's a really interesting question. Back in the days when I started there, and I assume it's the same for people who start there today, it's kind of comforting to have that name behind you and what feels like a big balance sheet and all of these products and so forth. And I think over time, definitely the financial crisis, I know a lot of your guests have referenced the financial crisis as doing damage, you know, in 08 and 09, when the banking crisis, it sort of, you know, the tide went out and you sort of saw how how weak uh, some of those balance sheets really were and how leveraged they were. And I think that permanently tarnished those names. But I think for me, the bigger issue was that, at, you know, after doing it for 25 years, I remember when we left Mindy, you'll probably laugh at this. I'll never forget one of the clients who came over says, well, you know, I'm glad you started your own firm. I didn't really like Merrill Lynch that much anyway. And I said, well, uh, it's nice because we came from Morgan Stanley. We, we were actually at Merrill. So I don't know that they cared a lot after a while. Maybe it helped me psychologically early. And maybe that brand had more cachet early in our career. But after you work with families for that many decades, I really, they just think of your team as their advisor. And I think they think less about the brand. And then there definitely is a move away from, from the bigger brands. And, and, and of, of course, you can just see it. Yeah. And how did your clients react to the news that you were going independent? We do deal with a lot of business owners. So I think the business owners respected kind of the entrepreneurial spirit. And I think they knew even better than we did uh, before we do it of, uh, you know, you have so much more control over culture. So we always tried to have a strong culture as a team within Morgan Stanley. But that's really hard to do to have kind of two separate missions and visions because there's sort of the mission and vision of a big firm. And then you kind of have your own team's mission and vision. It's just, and people are a little confused when they work on your team. Who do I actually work for? <laughs> this big parent company or the team? And you're like, well, kind of both. So the confusion goes away. And I think our clients really understood the bigger ones and the ones that have been with us a long time, kind of where our heart was, how we wanted to serve them. And they knew we were a little frustrated with not being able to deliver the kind of advice we wanted to deliver in the way we wanted to deliver it. And so I think they knew the level of freedom we would have, and they were happy for us. I generally do that. How did you best 
or how were you able to describe that freedom? And I'm sure that they were supportive of you and understood the freedom that it would give you in running your business. But how do you think that they came to understand the how freedom your freedom would ultimately impact them. What was in it for them, I guess, is what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes I would describe it too technically, right? You know, like we know that at the wirehouse, there's kind of a a pay for play. Money managers have to pay a certain amount to be on the platform. So my old accounting technical brain wants to explain all the technical ways we're going to save them money by a new share class that we could buy them that's institutional because there's not this much of a pay to play culture It's some of these uh, at Schwab and some other places like that. So I was kind of going the saving them money route kind of thing. But I think the thing that resonated the most was just describing what it meant to be a fiduciary. That seemed to really resonate with people. And I would describe it as said, when we were sitting at Morgan Stanley, we sort of had three legal hats on. One where we were representing the firm as a selling brokerage product. If I'm you know, selling them a uh, 529 plan, I'm wearing my brokerage hat at Morgan Stanley legally. And then I might talk to them about a mortgage or a loan. And now I'm wearing my, you know, I literally have a license as a banker at Morgan Stanley. And then I might talk about the rollover IRA that I would put into Morgan Stanley's RIA. They didn't call it that, but a fee-based platform. Now I'm a fiduciary on that conversation. But that's very confusing in the public. That's a lot of legal stuff for a client to understand. So we've just come up with the thing about says, we just rep- represent you 100% of the time as a client now. We just don't have any more of these conflicts. And people tend to resonate with that. They don't really want to know all the details. They're just happy that's happening. That makes sense. And how do prospects react to you representing archetype as opposed to a brand name that has more cachet and more well-known? Yeah, we just haven't had a problem with that. We're focusing more and more on one niche market. And I think the fallacy out there is that uh, you're limiting your audience, you know, that you'll you'll turn off other people. But I read a book called Scaling Up, that, and, and that's the one big thing I got out of it, really focus on these business owners who want to be generous that are exiting. And what we learned was nine out of 10 clients won't be that, but they're not offended by you having a focus. And for these folks, it's the most complicated kind of business. You're dealing with family dynamics and an exit and people that maybe haven't invested a lot in liquid markets before and all of those kind of things. So most of the people we're going after are those kind of folks. It's kind of like we're reading their mail. We know the questions they've got before they even think to ask them. And so that's what they want. They want advisors who can answer all their questions and meet all their needs. They don't care as much about what the brand is on the card, you know, and we hope to build a meaningful brand. But right now we're small and we know we don't have a lot of that. So we just try to serve the daylights out of them, not have them think too much about that. Yeah. You know, I think that's right, Jeff. It's funny. One of the things I talk about a lot is how there's been a tremendous shift in advisor mindset that advisors went from valuing, you know, where can I get the best transition package or most upfront money to really valuing freedom, flexibility, and control more than anything. But there's also been a real shift in client mindset that clients are much less wed to big brand names and much more about the trust that they feel in their advisor and the belief that the advisor is really putting their best interests first and doing what's right by them. Well said. Yeah. And how about replication of platform and products and services and technology going from the wirehouse world, UBS, then Morgan Stanley, um, and now independent? Do you feel that you're missing anything, that you have access to everything you needed? That's such a such a good question because, uh, and I've heard others of your guests talk about this, and I'll just echo it, which is it's unbelievable uh, really, it's the cloud, right? And not that I'm a technology expert, but you know, you used to have to, it, you know, scale used to be more important in our business because you needed a bunch of programmers building these software programs on your mainframe. And now you have the cloud where you could just rent the finest software on the planet. And I heard one of your guests talking about how when they left, some of the software they were buying, uh, they were using it uh, at, at Morgan Stanley. Well, I'll give you the example for us. Money Guide Pro is a financial planning software. When we left Morgan Stanley, they were white labeling it, but they kind of had version 1.0 in a lot of areas of it, estate planning and that kind of thing. Those modules locked down because, again, managing to the lowest common denominator is just what you have to do when you have that many advisors. And so they didn't have the latest version with everything unlocked. Well, 
when we're focused on one market and we know all our advisors so well, we have version 5.0 and it's all unlocked. So, so the software, just in that one instance, and there are many others, is more robust, but we're just renting it, you know, in the cloud. So I think this is one of the huge factors. Technology in the cloud is one of the huge factors enabling this high growth rate in, independent, in, in the independent channel. A hundred percent true. But one of the things that I think a lot of people that are considering independence worry about is feeling overwhelmed by too many choices. And especially for you, who's an independent independent, meaning you didn't even choose to go with a service provider who could simplify that stuff for you. Do you or did you feel overwhelmed by the array of options available to you in every category in with respect to investments and lending, insurance, alternatives, technology, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I'm sitting in my home office as I speak to you now uh, that I built out during that transition that six months before we launched. And it's been very helpful for uh, COVID, as you can imagine. But that speaks to I would do my day job at Morgan Stanley and then I would come home and work on all of these things for months. And as I say, I'm really not a DIY guy. So Schwab did a great job of kind of giving me three choices for every category I had to pick something. But I tell you, it is overwhelming. And so as we talked about at the top a little bit, I wouldn't recommend picking out everything. It's just too much work to have two jobs doing all of those kind of things, unless you kind of have a vision like we do for scale for the long, long haul. I think there are aggregators and other firms like ours, you know, pick, pick a flavor that feels good to you. If you feel led to go independent and sort of join in, you can kind of rent it <laughs> from Dynasty uh, or you can build it as, as we did, or you can join one that's already going. And I think for most folks, joining one or, or, or using one of those service providers to kind of make those choices for you is a, is a great way to do it. But once it's up and running, it's not so bad, right? So a lot less painful now. Uh, it was just a few months of a ton of work. Yeah. Yeah. I want to pivot for a second. A common practice today at the big brokerage firms is to tie advisors up via the each firm sunset program, a retire in place program. So that's Morgan's FAP or UBS's alpha program or Merrill CTP. I know you're relatively young and you weren't even 50, I believe, when you left Morgan. But what were your thoughts at the time around succession planning? And what I'm asking you is, as you thought about the trajectory of your career and the notion that whether it be 10 years, 20 years, or a year from now, that you were going to retire, the opportunity to retire in place and monetize your business without having to move can be really compelling and appealing for a lot of folks. So what do you think about that strategy overall? And do you feel like you missed anything by giving that up? This is such a good question. And it's so timely. And I know you're dealing with a lot of people who this has to be on the top three of their list, if they're honest, right? So really, there are a lot of good people in our business trying to do the right thing for clients. And, you know, sometimes they're a little hesitant. Maybe uh, you would know better than I to worry too much about their own monetary thing. But of course, it's one of their issues. And of course, the firms are shifting more now than ever. When I left, they weren't as lucrative as they are today. But we're in the business of recruiting advisors right now, right? Who feel called to have a find a place like ours. We just want them to know we exist, right? So I'm thankful for this ability to talk about what we do. But so we're talking to a lot of advisors who are in that camp and they have a contract in front of them. Mindy, as you know, they, they don't always, there's a lot of legalese in there. It, it appears to me, and maybe you can uh, back me up on this or tell me if it's different, but it seems like they're offering a lot more money to the senior advisor, but they're going to lock up their junior folks, right? And so to me, this goes back to exactly how you operate, which is tell me what you want to do. Mr. or Mrs. Advisor, if you love working at Merrill and you want to stay there forever and uh, you've got a daughter in the business or a couple of juniors that want to stay in the business and they love Merrill and are happy to stay there for the next 30 years, great. If that's what you think you're supposed to do, just I think the key is do your research. And uh, we joke, Mindy, sometimes about do you want to take the blue pill or the red pill, right? Once you start researching independence, uh, there's a lot to learn. And uh, I think it's really hard to resist if you're wired a certain way or you're being called to do things in a different way. If you want to take the blue pill and just go back to the White House and kind of forget about that rabbit trail of learning all those things, or you just feel led to stay, great. Just to understand what you're doing, 
And so for us, the advisors that are looking to join us and do join us, generally they're looking for a very different culture. And uh, it's so different. So what we try to do is help them monetize as, as well or better than they would at the wirehouse, but kind of free that up. And, and, and a lot of them are worried about that, where that next generation is going to be. And if they will actually ask the next generation, a lot of them don't want to be in that wirehouse environment. They see the puck moving to, uh, you know, RA only and a different culture. And so I'm just thinking in for market type because that's how I think all the time. But uh, the folks that are coming to us is probably a push financially for the senior group, but they get to serve their clients in a, in a unique way and, and empower their next generation to be on a platform that uh, might have more fun and more growth and more impact. Well, I think you hit it on the head. The retire in place programs can be really, really good ways for a senior advisor to monetize his or her life's work without the disruption of a move. The people that have to really pay attention to the fine print are just that the next gen inheritors or the younger generation, because A, they're being asked to buy a business that they're not going to own at the end of the day. And B, they're the ones that are being tied up for the life of the agreement. So all parties better be darn sure that it's what they want. But when you factor in, you know, there are some people that for that mechanism, the ability to stay in one place for the whole of your career and monetize without having to make a move, it's a wonderful option. And when the big firms came out with these sunset programs, it was a real coup for top advisors. It was a great way to stay put and monetize. But I think you hit it on the head that If an advisor wants something else, you know, it's not enough that it's about just the succession plan or the ability to retire in place, but it's equally, what do they want to be when they grow up? And can they do that within the confines of the wirehouse world? You nailed it. What I always say is the margins are the margins, Mindy. RIE only, obviously we don't have the scale of the big firms. We hope to one day. But our margins are almost exactly the same because we're more efficient, okay? And we're RA only, okay? That eliminates some of the compliance costs and legal costs and all of those kind of things. So, you know, everybody can kind of pay the same thing. Honestly, there's no magic margin. So money is kind of money. Margins are kind of margins. It really boils down to exactly what you said. Spend some time as advisor creating your own vision. How do you really want to serve your clients? Who are the people on your team you want to partner with? How do you, what are the ways you want to communicate, right? Are you able to envision three to five years, where do you want to be? And and then let that drive it. Don't let the money drive it. The money's kind of a push wherever you go, in my opinion. Frankly, let's put it this way. Wherever you're the happiest serving people, people are going to read that and you're probably going to grow the business. So even if you feel like you're leaving something behind for us, I'm so bought into this RA only theme. People can see that I have passion about it. And I think passion sells. So go where you're passionate and the money will follow. That is my philosophy too. I'm with you all the way on that one. Well, Jeff, it sounds like you're doing amazing things and you're on to even bigger and better things. And most importantly, you're living your most authentic and best life. And that can never be wrong. So look forward to hearing more about your successes as you move forward and hope you'll come back again and share them with us. And in the meantime, wishing you all the best and certainly continued success. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, Mindy. Pleasure. For Jeff, independence was the only path he could see which would provide him and his team the ability to move from success to significance, as he puts it, and serve their clients as true fiduciaries. And one might say they're succeeding in that mission and then some. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached by cell at 973-476-8578 
or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And if you're listening on the Apple Podcast app, I'd be grateful if you'd give it a star rating. That lets other advisors know it's a show worth their time to listen to. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.